Okay, welcome everybody to the Langberg uh, live stream chat. And let me just arrange my screens here so I can make sure that everything is um, working well. Okay, this is good. Um, we are super excited to um, be joining you today from different parts of the world. My name is Marion McNeely and I am currently located in sunny Southern California and I'm an independent uh, researcher, fashion and clothing historian. Um, and I've been working on um, the um, Langberg finds um, for, uh, let's see, since 2015, I think. Um, and I got involved because Rachel, <laughs> over to you, Rachel. Hi, I'm Rachel Case and I'm one of the uh, Langberg team researchers and I've been interested in the Langberg finds since 2012 and got involved in 2015 with Beatrix. Hi, I'm Beatrix and I'm the um, archaeologist, archaeologist in charge and uh, I am working on the extant finds and uh, I'm not a very good tailor myself so I asked uh, Rachel if she could help me and then Marion joined and I'm very glad because I'm way in over my head with all this tailoring stuff. Yeah. All right. Um, so uh, we have a uh, we have an agenda for this meeting, um, but it really is also we've got plenty of space for people's questions. So please put your questions in the live chat, um, and we've got a moderator who will collect them and um, give them to us for question time. Um, but <clears throat> we really want to hear what you want to know about. It. We've got some examples, um, we've got various examples we've made, and some um, extant items uh, for the camera. So. Um, all right, let's get started. All right, are you ready for me to share my screen? Yes. Get started, okay. So, bear with me. Okay, whoop. So uh, in 2015, I was able to travel to the University of Innsbruck and work with Beatrix uh, on, on, in inspecting these, these textiles. And uh, one of the first things she put in front of me was the, the bra, the skirted bra. And this thing, it blew my mind, of course, to see this uh, almost right off the plane. She brought it right out for me. So in this picture here, you can see me looking at one of the finds and also Marion and I inspecting what we figured out finally was a, a gown, which we'll look out later. So this is the skirted bra or supportive sleeveless chemise where it's hard to decide on, on sort of the terminology for this thing because it's not technically just a bra and it's not technically just a chemise. It's something uh, very different uh, and unique. So all that's left of this garment is basically just the front and it's pretty fragmentary. So. Um, I was able to inspect uh, this piece and get some pretty good photographs. Uh, and I'm just gonna like scroll through these. So if you have any questions about what you're seeing, just put them in the chat and we'll talk about them in a bit. So this is the right cup, the left cup. Uh, sort of a close up of the upper left edge of the bra. You can see there's some needle lace uh, still attached to the piece along the inner edge here. I don't know if my cursor shows up. <laughs> this is the inside of one of the cups showing the stitches. And one of the most surprising things about uh, inspecting these garments was the, the size of the thread. Uh, I always uh, had thought that thread should be very fine, just like our modern thread. And, uh, one thing that I uh, was really surprised about was how thick this thread is. It's another picture of the inside of a cup, sort of a half back stitch for the uh, seam of the cup, and then it is filled down with felling stitches. 
So what we're seeing here is the eyelet edge that's left. There's only one eyelet edge left. Um, and those eyelets are not beautiful. That's another thing that really uh, surprised me was that things are not perfect. Um, people made these things to wear and to use. So they weren't necessarily concerned about perfection. Here's another close up of the eyelet edge. This is the space between the cups. So I wanted to see how that was constructed. And it is kind of a mess of threads and, and uh, fabric, but I was able to figure out in my reconstruction how that was um, made. This is the inside of the same thing. If you look closely along this, um, sort of the, the right side of this ripped edge, you can see that there was a seam that went down the middle of the, um, the, the bodice of this piece. So this is on the right, a cup, and on the left, a cup, and this is the space just below them. And this is a, a, my reconstruction, my, uh, my example. And um, so some things I had to extrapolate and figure out, like the spring is no longer there. So we guessed that perhaps spring was between the, the cup spaces. So I created a similar spring piece uh, to the another spring piece that's in the finds uh, and inserted it in between the cups. Underpants. So this is, this is a, a pair of underpants. Um, this is uh, many layers of linen and Beatrix can talk to this, but there's many layers of linen and I think four, and they're not all the same weave. And they're um, obviously, I don't think they're original. It's been patched over and over. This is an up close of the underpants like the crotch. <laughs> what we're looking at here is the back edge of the underpants. This is laid out flat. Um, one side was left open and there are ties that um, tie on one side. And the other side is permanently tied like in a knot, but I couldn't figure out whether or not it was just knotted to stay that way purposely or if it was purposely sewn that way um, or if it had two ties originally, two sets of ties. So I made two different reconstructions of the underpants. This is the first one with uh, one tie sort of just um, attached at e to the front and to the back and then a tie uh, on the right side or two ties on the right side. And then this is the one that I'm most convinced was how they originally were constructed. And so probably the person who wore these underpants left one side tied all the time and untied the other side for reasons. And here we, oh, am I moving ahead too far? No, I'm good. So, Originally, this garment was categorized as a, uh, a bust supportive garment because the other garment did look just like a bra and functioned like one. We thought that perhaps this one also was a bra. And I tried many, many times, there were several mock-ups of trying to make this work as a bust supportive garment, but it never was gonna work. And so, just in passing, I was looking for other images online for the, uh, the sort of a pleated gown. And I saw a woman in one of these images wearing headwear that had what looked like a central panel uh, on, uh, of spraying or netting of some sort. And so a light bulb went off in my head. And then <laughs> it took a couple of years to get brave enough to talk to Beatrix about the fact that I thought it was a headwear and not a bra. <laughs> so we have some up close uh, images here of the headwear. And uh, this is the inside right panel. So this is a linen panel, a spring panel in the middle is obviously very um, damaged. 
<clears throat> we also have here. Hey, Rachel. Yeah. Can you pause and because there's a whole been a whole bunch of questions in the comments well, about especially with the underwear um, and the spraying insert on the bra. So can we pause Wait, and take take those questions? Yeah. Let's go back because if, if people want to see those things, we can look at those things. Sure. Okay. So um, the uh, there the question was for the eyelets: Are there pat padding threads around it under the eyelet stitches? Um, Beatrix might have an answer for you. I did not see anything special. We can go, I don't know if you can see these. Yeah, it, it just really looks like the, the linen thread has been pushed out of the way. Doesn't look really like padding stitches. No, it's just, it's just whip stitches. And on, there's nothing un, supportive uh, underneath. I didn't see anything. Yeah. Okay. Um, this is really thick thread. Yes. yes. Yeah, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, and then so two ply yarn, so really thick actually. I think about I don't know half half a millimeter or something, mm -hmm. at least. Um, and then what sort of stitches were used on the underwear? Okay. So many. Um so for the cups and for around the cups, I used a back stitch, but when I was experimenting later on, I discovered that probably they were half back stitches. So it's kind of like a running stitch back stitch combo. So instead of having the stitches touching, they, there's a little space between them. It looks like a running stitch from one side, but it's a half back stitch. Um, to fill the seams, it's just a, um, a, 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 not quite a whip stitch, but a hemming seam. Um, on the edge of the eyelet, there is an actual back stitch here, and you can see on the inside. So the outside is a back stitch, on the inside, it's very obviously a back stitch. Um, and I think that's it. Whip stitches. Okay. And then on the men's underwear, what stitches were used on that? Hemming stitch and whip stitch. They're very um, basic stitches. Okay. Um, and then what is the effect of the spraying insert on the skirted bra? It seems like it would reduce the support to have a laterally expansive structure at that location. Um, let me go back to that. Okay, so if you don't put something in between the cups up at the top here, it will would flap and gape open. So our best guess was to, um, my best guess was to create along the top edge here. Um, can you see my cursor? Yes. When I see this? Okay, along the top edge here of the space between the cups, that is a finger loop braid there's a cord going through the top of the spring part. And so that's helping to keep that area um, sort of rigid. The spring itself is slightly stretchy, but does not perform its stretchy function for this, um, for this purpose. It covers the, the um, cleavage, it sort of provides some modesty. I have an example that I use and wear and I don't have any trouble with gaping or weird stretching or warping. Okay, and then we've got a question. Could the, uh, we've got a thread count question, um, but first we're gonna, uh, somebody has asked, could the underpants be used um, by women on their period days? All right, that's a pretty contentious thing. <laughs> Um, all right, so when I came into this project, I was convinced these underwear were for women because power for women. And the more I found images of men wearing these underpants, I was convinced that men wore them pretty exclusively. That doesn't mean that women could not or would not have worn them, but we have no evidence about it. Uh, and, not, and there may be some writings about it. And I think Beatrix, we talked about this at one point um, about women wearing underpants, but I think it's just one source that we know of. 
Yes, there's just one source. I think it's a French, French source, um, where, well, it's actually a sex scene, so so to say, where uh, he uh, has to take off her underpants, mm. <laughs> in in order to be able to perform. Uh, but uh, this woman um, was not the, an honorable woman. She was more like a prostitute. And you can also see sometimes prostitutes wearing underpants. So it was not something um, that would have been worn by a respectable woman or should not have been worn by a respectable woman. Um, as to what women would have worn um, during their um, uh, menses, um, there is one uh, written record um, of a bishop actually who uh, declared for the uh, nun for a nunnery that on the days of the female illness they are supposed to be given extra linen but that's all I could find it doesn't say what type of extra linen but he said the, the nuns on their day of their female illness are to be given extra linen whatever that should mean. Hmm, interesting. Um, we have a question about where the pants DNA tested. Yes. Beatrix. Hmm? Were, the pan were the underpants be uh, DNA tested? Uh, yes, uh, we did take DNA tests, but uh, without results. The only DNA on those underpants happened to be mine because I touched them beforehand. Um, so we've uh, someone asked, do you think the center seam on the bra had a purpose or does it seem to have just been pieced? The one, yeah, that one right there. Uh, I don't have a good answer for that. Um, judging from some of the other textiles in the find, uh, which were pieced, they may have been trying to uh, conserve fabric, but I've seen people make successful um, reconstructions without the seam. I personally, I think I might want the seam there because um, because if, if you have any sort of um, pull or tension on that fabric, it might be more likely to split or rip there. Whereas if you have a seam there, it might be stronger. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's move on to the headwear and um, move back to finishing up. Uh, and move on to the shirts, I think, next. Right. So, oops, sorry, I need to get rid of the chat <laughs> and I can't. All right, it's okay. Um, so these are just some of the up close images of the headwear that we thought was a bra. So when I was in Innsbruck, I was assuming this was a bra and that we would reconstruct it as a bra. Um, if anybody has questions about what you're seeing here, um, obviously put them in the chat. But because we are, we want to be mindful of time, I'm not going to chat too much about what you're seeing here. The spraying is made of very thick um, linen thread or yarn. I think Beatrix, if I'm not wrong, it's 0.8 millimeters. Whoops, sorry. <laughs> Ah, I'm trying to go back, sorry. <laughs> 0.8 millimeters thick um, or 0.7. And I think my reconstruction might've been 0.8. Does that sound right, Beatrix? Um, yes, just about, yes. It's more or less the same type of, of thread that's been used for sewing yeah. in some pieces. Yeah. So what you're seeing here is uh, a tie with a knot still in the piece. Um, this is needle lace between the main panel of the headwear and the tails of the headwear that tie the piece. Marion, did you have a question? Um, yeah, what are the, uh, what's the thread count on the, the headwear? The thread count on the original headwear? Yes. Beatrix, do you know that off the top of your head? Take I don't know. Um, let's guess. Not, not much probably about 13 threads per centimeter or something like that. Yeah, I was going to say between 11 and 13 off the top of my head that I could think of. 
I think the finest linen we've got is the sleeve uh, of a shirt, and that's got 18. That's right. the finest linen I've got. It's got 18 threads per centimeter. And all other things are, are less. Yeah, one of the things that I was most, I find most interesting about the Langberg finds is how rough the linen is in some cases. It's not, I mean, yeah. <laughs> yeah, anyway. Not super fine. Which it's not super fine, no. Makes me think about who wore these things and who lived in this castle. You see if you were minor nobility, if I'm not incorrect. The knight and his family were there in the 15th century. That's the headwear. So now we're on to shirts. So this is a what we think is a baby's shirt. And the threads per centimeter are very coarse. I think it's something like six or eight threads per centimeter. Does that sound right, Beatrix? Yes, yes. Very coarse. And it was difficult to find a coarse linen. Um, all of my reconstructions, for the most part, except for the child shirt and the skirted bra, are made with vintage linens. Um, those I did purchase modern linens for. So this is a vintage linen, um, and it, I think it was like eight uh, threads per centimeter. And I had to do a lot of extrapolating for this piece because this is all that's left. So I used uh, images from later finds, um, from the Janet Arnold, uh, I think it's Pattern of Fashion 4, the one with the shirts and rough. Um, as sort of a guide. Here's the child shirt and what's left of it. I did see on, um, somebody was talking on a, um, a Facebook group wondering if this was a 16th century um, piece, but it is 15th century. If, am I correct there, Beatrix? Yes, yes. Everything there is 15th century. Uh, one of the shirts was uh, radiocarbon dated, and it's the uh, second half of the 15th century. So what you're seeing here is a, a shoulder uh, piece, and you'll see that in the, hopefully you'll see that in the uh, reconstruction image. Almost like a little yoke piece on the shoulder here. Uh, and this is the front part of the shirt. And we're looking at the inside of the shirt, so we're seeing sort of these uh, stem stitches that are holding the pleats in place along the neck edge. Um, this is the remainder of a sleeve right here, and this is the remainder of part of the front of the child's shirt. And this is my reconstruction. Uh, it is made up of three panels in the front, and I believe it's one panel in the back. Because there were remnants of seams left, um, I made the, the choice of creating three panels in the front and just one in the back. And based on a, a, a cuff that was left, I did create a pleated cuff. The, the cuff was not remaining from the this shirt. It was from another shirt. So this is the adult shirt, and it's quite similar in its construction uh, to the child shirt. Um, you can see the shoulder piece here what's left of some uh, wave seams. This is, um, I think it's three panels in the front. Ooh, now I'm not remembering. I think maybe it's four panels in the back and four panels in the front. So many panels of fabric make up this, um, this shirt. Marion, feel free to stop me if anybody has questions about the shirt. Um, we did have a um, question of, um, do we know what class of people use them? And is there any evidence of waxing sewing, uh, of waxing the sewing thread or the lace threads before they were um, sewn? Okay, so what was the first part of that question? Because that was a Beatrix question. Sorry, <laughs> which class of people wore these? Um, well, the castle where these were found was a castle of the uh, lower nobility, um, so not very high up. Uh, at, of course, we don't quite know if it was the lords of the castle who wore these, the lords and their children, or if it were 
servants. It could also have been some servants who have worn these. So we can't really say with these shirts uh, who wore them. Of course, we have these th this uh, girl's gown with red silk that was probably from, from the daughter of the lord of the castle. Uh, but with the other stuff, we don't really know. And uh, could we find any traces of a um, waxing? So I don't know. Probably, maybe, maybe not. Um, the thing is, the, the sewing thread, the plied yarn, is very, very, uh, very twisted. And it doesn't really fray that easily. So you might not need to actually wax it. Um, but, of course, these things have been washed multiple times uh, during being worn and any traces of wax is probably gone by now. Right. Um, I waxed my thread as I sewed because I find that it, even though, and I'll talk about the threads I used in a couple of minutes, even though I didn't use commercial thread, I did wax my threads for strength and to keep them from getting fuzzy or becoming unplied at some point. I did not wax my yarn or thread when I did my spring and it worked out just fine. I didn't need to. So that makes me wonder, did I need to do it with threading or sewing? Because I'm pulling the threads through the fabric, it will um, get some damage um, without waxing. But because spraying is done um, by twisting and really you're only touching, for me, I was really only touching the middle threads and doing some um, beading of the, the yarns, uh, it, it didn't damage it enough to really cause a problem. Now, if I, when I use modern threads, that's a totally different story. <laughs> and I actually found that using um, crochet yarn for spraying works really, really well. <laughs> so these are some sleeve cups, sleeve cups. Uh, and this is what I based my sleeves on for the adult shirt. So the shirt you just saw was an adult shirt. And this is my reconstruction. Um, so I think that is four panels in the front and four in the back. I think I'd remember that. <laughs> and then, okay, so on the left here, we have uh, an image of some extant threads uh, that I used as a guide for my spinner. I actually did ask a friend to spin some flax for me uh, to get the thickness and the, the ply in the right direction and the right um, Tightness. And that was very difficult for her. You can see on the top image here that it is not quite the angle it needs to be at. The angle should be um, when she did this red, this is much better. And then the bottom one. So this thickest one is what I used for the spring um, and for some, uh, I think for the child shirt. Uh, and then the thinner threads I used for sewing. And I think that's the end of my presentation. So I'm going to stop share. Oh, we have a couple of questions. <laughs> sure, I can reshare, no problem. Um, so. Do we have, for, is there evidence of a thread being pulled um, to um, pleat the shirts evenly? So you could count the threads evenly. Um, uh, you mean like then, a gathering stitch? Oh, yeah. I'm basically like, were there any threads pulled? Could you see any threads? I, I, I've looked at those and I couldn't see any. No. So I, I think they just were counting and picking it up or just, you know, eyeballing it. They're not, yeah. For, for the pleats? Yeah, for the pleats on the shirts. So I tried it a couple of different ways. Um, one, I tried to pull, like to create a running stitch and pull together. I found that that was, it's really hard for me to control the how the pleats go. That may be just me. Um, they didn't feel neat enough for me to, to pleat that way. Um, but then I have also pinned them. So I will pin individual pleats and that works much better. And I'm able to control the direction of the pleats because they are directional on the. Right. Um, um, and then is there any indication of how wide uh, the, I'm, I'm so, uh, it says how wide the panels of the shirt were. Is it possible to determine if these panels were salvage to salvage? I don't believe they were salvage to salvage. Uh, Beatrix can speak to whether or not a salvage was found anywhere, but I'm pretty sure 
Right. Uh, we, uh, uh, only one, there was only one one shirt sleeve that uh, where there was a salvage. That was the shirt sleeve with the finest linen, with the one with the 18 uh, threads per centimeter, with the with the, the one with the very 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 many pleats. Um, that was actually made out of two two panels that were sewn together, salvage to salvage, salvage with whip stitches. And I calculated that the total width of the fabric just for this sleeve would have to be one. 120 centimeters. So a very, very puffy sleeve. It's beautiful. I mean, it's uh, it's just amazing to look at that piece um, on the exam on the examining table. <laughs> it's really beautiful in it uh, compared to some of the other stuff that's in the finds. Um, where the seams fell in the same direction are all towards the center or outward. Different or same for child shirt and adult shirt. Ooh, I, I would have to go look at them. Like, okay. uh, let me see if I can show my screen. Do you have the child shirt? No, wait, let's see. This is the, the adult shirt. Ah, oh, nice. No, a sleeve from the child shirt. Oh, my God. This is very dense. Um, well, here I've got the the neckline here from the from the um, adult shirt and one of the sleeves of the the child shirt. And the the pleats looked at from the outside all go um, bent to the to the right, both with both shirts. So that's that's what I can see now. I don't have every shirt here with me; just these two things here. So I'm looking at my reconstruction and I very carefully followed what the expert teacher that research sent me. Because I didn't inspect those when I was in, in 2015. I was mostly interested in the underwear. So um, he has sent me lots of images. But the, I'm looking at the left edge here and I'm looking at the this front first panel is Felled toward the center on the left side and felled toward the center on the right side. So they're near each. Um, and I'm 99% sure I use the extant seams as an example. Um, if not, I mirrored them because it made sense to mirror them. Okay. Um, on the shoulder yoke, on the shoulder yoke pieces, they are um, spelled outward toward, toward the sleeve. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Um, uh, how is the eyelet for the button formed on the... that make a really good video. <laughs> I love it. Well, and, you know, I don't know if you've even said it yet, Marion, but we are going to do a series of these where we look more closely at each garment. This right. is made with just a button hole. So it's the extra. Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. I'll try to speak louder. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Too quiet. Did that answer the question? Um, I don't have the baby shirt with me, but, um, right. oh, oh, can you set that up again, Beatrix, please? Yeah. Get it okay, this is the, the extant one, let's see. Which is the one I'm basing mine on. Yeah. Hard to see. <laughs> <laughs> we do have photographs of the extant piece, and we may be able to get permission to use those uh, when we do an episode about that. So we'll look, look more closely. Any other questions? Um, yes, there are lots of questions actually. <laughs> um, when, oh my goodness. One, are there more publications describing the findings and how they're reconstructed? And the answer is yes, um, which is a really simple answer. We'll get to that later. I'll answer that more in more detail later. And then when you do the reconstruction, which to should you use for the needle lace to attach the spring? I've been trying to figure out and it's driving me mad. Which stitch did I use for the needle lace to attach the spring? On the headwear? I believe so. 
Okay. So I don't have, Beatrix doesn't have the hat either, or the headwear either. Um, it's just a, oh, there's a name for this stitch, and I can't remember what the name of it. Um, it's just a very basic, it's all the needle lace is based off of a buttonhole stitch, right? And so it's just a double buttonhole stitch. I don't know if I can, this is my personal one. It's gotten stretched out. The spring's not, um, I don't know if you can see that. It's just a sort double, of. Yeah, it's a double um, buttonhole stitch. It's very, very simple, super simple. I'll have to do a video about that sometime. Yes. <laughs> I think I actually have, but I can do another one. Uh, um, oh. Isn't there a drawing in, in, in the um, publication we have on, on Academia on the sprang headwear? I think there's a drawing of that stitch. Oh. Yes. This person, uh, apparently they wanted to know about the needle lace on test the sprang on the bra. Oh, same stitch. So same stitch, double, just that double needle lace um, stitch. Uh, I feel like okay. it's Russell. Yeah, I wish I could remember. I'm not a I'm not a lace person, so I right. just copied the picture. <laughs> I, I saw a question about how the headwear stays on. And yes. that's a really, really good question. It, it just, it ties on. Um, I have short hair. I used to have long hair. Um, I would just create a, a, a double braid that I tied on with a, um, with a, just a tape, a hair tape. And when it goes on your head, I can't see because I have my glasses on, so hopefully you can see okay. So there the spring is, is stretchy. This is looser. Um, I the the reconstruction I made for Beatrix is much tighter. For some reason, when I do spring, the top is always nice and tight, and the bottom is always looser. So I use the looser spring for for my headwear, and so yeah, it's very stretchy, and it's stretchy anyway. But so this is the tails crossed in the back. Mm -hmm. Can you see that? Yep. Cross and back. And so the really cool thing about this is the extant piece has a knot in it. And the knot is almost exactly where I would knot it, like on my own head. I have a little head. So we think that the person, oh, this is probably a hot mess. I bet this is a lot of fun to watch right now. <laughs> Um, so the knot goes in the front. I made extra long tails and I usually will just cross them back over each other in the back and cut them under. It stays on. It does not move around really at all. And I have a second piece that I made that is um, done with a different pattern, the knot in the top. Honestly, when I wear mine, I put the knot in the back. I like the way it looks with the knot at the back of the head with the tail tucked under kind of along yeah. the side here. And it's interesting when you look at these different, like once you know what you're looking for, you can see the same headwear with the spring insert all in all different kinds of, of um, pic, uh, images and manuscripts and uh, alder pieces and stuff like that. And they were all worn different ways. There was no one standard way of wearing it. Um, someone asked, how did you handle the mirroring factor spring when you made the insert between the frock cups? What did you do with the second half, the unused half of the spring textile? And I'm thinking like, I think you just made other pieces with it, right? Yeah, I just made, uh, you know, in fact, I wonder if it's, it's in that bra right there. Um, <laughs> so I gave one half to Beatrix and it's uh, it, with her in Austria and this one is in mine that I wear. I'm in the SDA, so I... I wear this under my garb, which is what I wear for my um, best to fit yeah. when I wear scarf. Oh, so yeah, so this kind of spring headwear would be um, seen in uh, Germany and Austria. That's that's my area, geographic area of specialty. Um, and so that's where I'm seeing it in manuscripts and altarpieces and things like that. So as far as I know, it is, I've not never seen anything like it in England, but that's a completely different fashion world right. than, um, than Germany and Austria. And um, fashion was incredibly regional um, then 
And I think it's only been like the last, I don't know, maybe 20, 30 years when fashion's become much more international and not quite so distinct. Right. So, okay. I think um, we, look, let me look over the questions really quickly. Um, you while you're looking at that, I do you want me to address my... Yeah, go right ahead. Um, oh, somebody wanted to know if there's been a comparison between the linen at Langberg and the finds at Alperspach. That's a Beatrix question. <laughs> and I have, I, I haven't done that myself. I didn't know if Beatrix has, has, have you compared them with other linen finds? I don't, I don't know the, the, well, I have seen pictures of the Alpersbach, of course, but I've never seen them in person, so I can't compare them. Besides the, the um, Alpersbach, that's 16th century. So, um, uh, I don't know, I think it's, there's a, this, this linen uh, doublet, isn't there, and the linen hose? They do look yeah. rather, rather, rather coarse also from, from the fabric, as what I can remember from the images I've seen. Yeah, I've seen them in person. Seen yeah, I've seen them in person a couple of times because we lived like an hour and change away from Alpersbach. So uh, we went up there a couple of times and it is, it's quite coarse and the linen uh, garments in, in Alpersbach are, um, uh, if I'm trying to remember, I think they're twills, whereas uh, Langberg seems to be all um, tabby plain woven. Uh, most most is most is plain woven, but we do have some twills. Yes, twill linens. Yes. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay. Not not any big pieces. No, 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 not any big pieces. There is one of this the strip from the uh, the herringbone twill on the uh, uh, child's red gown. That's right. Yes. Yeah, that is true. Yes. Okay, so Rachel's currently dressing uh, the gown. She started out with the, the skirted bra already on the mannequin, then she put the shirt over the top of it, and now she's putting her reproduction gown on. Um, um, so. I think we should watch the time. It's already... Yes, I think we are... Um, let me just check with our moderator to make sure we are good on time. So I need to tell you guys what the gown that I made that I made was made before I made this shirt. This gown is for me, and I wore a different. I wear a different shirt underneath it. So the neckline, I don't know if you can see, the neckline is higher on the gown or on the shirt than the gown. So uh, if I were to make another uh, gown, I think I would bring up the neckline. But this is based on the shirt. The circumference of the uh, of the shirt's neckline. Right. So someone asked earlier, like, how widespread were these styles? And um, they are uh, definitely. Um, this is definitely a, I'd say, a Central European style. So we see a lot of these um, pleated. I, I call them Gothic styles. Um, of gown um, because uh, anyway um, they, they're during the Gothic era and the pleats and the structure um, kind of mirror um, the the Gothic architecture in the cathedrals um, a bit. So we see them throughout um, Germany and Austria, um, possibly northern Italy in the Tyrol. I mean. Further down into, into the Tyrol, I have not studied that part of Italy thoroughly yet. A lot of the um, Italians don't have the same digitization push that um, Germany and Austria have had for the last 10 years. So it's a little bit harder to research German uh, Italian manuscripts um, from, <laughs> from home <laughs> instead of being right there in the library. Um, but, uh, and I'm not sure about Hungary and Poland. Um, I have not done the research into those areas, but I can tell you that throughout um, Southern, Southern Germany and into Austria, these styles were very, very common. So, um, okay. 
and let's see. Um, I guess, are there any other questions on these topics that we need to cover um, before we move on? I don't think so. Okay, I think it's my turn to share my screen. Let me get, um, let me get to the right spot. Nope, that's not what I want. Just a moment, let me get to, sorry, technology's not behaving itself at the moment. All right, share screen, link for Q&A. Okay, so there are three dresses found at Langberg and I have made, um, uh, reconstructions on two of them. I've finished one and I'm going to fit, no, talk, we're working on the other one. So the first one is the blue wool, blue wool girl's gown. Um, this is uh, almost the most complete. Um, the red silk gown has slightly more pieces, um, but none of the gowns have sleeves. They just have the remnants. So here we have the front of the gown um, and the side seam, and then the very distinctive back um, with what I call the, the, the pleat fan. Um, I'm sure there was a, an actual term for it. I don't know what it was in period German. Um, and then here's the side seam. You can see these basting stitches and just how really um, rough the, uh, the linen is um, on this lining. It's very um, heavy, thick, rough lining. Um, some key points to, to point out. Um, so this shoulder yoke right here, so shoulder yoke, it's actually just a piecing um, so that the, the shoulder seam and this neck edge are on the, are on the stable grain. And it's actually a much finer um, weave of linen um, than the other pieces. So the part that would be closest to the neck edge where it would be against the tender part of the skin, um, not covered by the shirt is a finer um, weave. Um, and then on the back, this, these strap pieces right here are on the straight of grain. Um, They're not on the bias, but uh, the cut is such so that this part transitions the bias. And then this piece down here is on the full bias. Um, and then of course, right here, you can see that this side seam is on the full bias as well. Um, and then this part here is on the straight of grain. This front part is on the straight of grain. The pleats on this gown are, are formed by a extension coming off of the center front and extending over. And then the, the pleats are, are pleated into the, the body. Um, and so that's actually a different method of creating the pleats than the woman's gown. Um, let me just go to that next. Actually. Let me, let me cover the fan. <laughs> so the, the pleat fan or the, um, is, this is on the right hand side, we have what is remaining of the wool outer layer um, after the mice and uh, uh, moths have eaten it away, which allows us to be able to see um, what's, what, was, what was inside the stitching, one might say. Um, there's this brown um, linen thread, it's actually quite thick. Um, no evidence of waxing, but I will tell you that um, it really does need to be waxed in order to go through the fabric well. Um, it's such thick thread. I did not hire someone to um, uh, reproduce <laughs> by hand spinning um, linen thread. I bought mine from a weaver supply store. Um, and it's, uh, for those of you who know weaving thread, it's a, a 16 slash two linen yarn. It is not a thread. We'll talk, I have examples of like sewing machine thread and some other linen thread I have. I'll show you that in just a minute. Um, but it, what basically you've got is you've got lines of um, basting stitches that connect the, the, um, the linen and the wool together. Um, and then, uh, um, 
and then you've got this uh, line here of chain stitch that holds the pleats in place and doesn't let them spread. And the exact technique for doing that chain stitch perfectly, I have not mastered yet. Um, that is, it is definitely one of those things where I wish, I wish I could go back in time and get a, a YouTube video of a master tailor doing this project because it's like, ah, how do they do this? Um, but uh, interestingly enough, the um, the linen is seamed up the back. So this is a center seam for the linen thread for the sorry, for the linen lining. But on the wool, it's not actually um, it's not there's no seam at the same spot where the seam for the for the wool stops right here, um, and it's just a fold. So they're actually like sandwiching the linen on either sides of the fold of the um the fold in the wool and stitching through both layers to basically create a false pleat in the wool down the center back um to control things and um and then there's there's several ways they control the pleats here at the tightest point there's a thread going through on the outside that controls it from the outside. And then there's several lines of, um, of back stitch that, that hold the linen on the inside. So this pleat is very, very stable. It is not um, moving anywhere. Um, uh, for the extension of the pleats on the, uh, on the front, it's, it's actually a triangle sort of, it's parts of a circle. Um, we have the diagram for this dress in the NISAT paper, which I believe I have linked below in the description for this video. Um, so, all right, moving on to the, um, and as far as like what the thread count is on this, I don't recall. Um, stitching, the, it's just, back stitching upon back more back stitching <laughs> oh my goodness like miles of back stitching on this gown um all right so here's the women's gown um and it it has a different um a very different construction for the front um this is much more this is shaped um uh, much more around the bust um and we again, there is a shoulder piece that comes down here, um, which is a separate piece, which so that the 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 neck edge and the front um, piece that comes down the center front is on the straight of grain. Um, but this piece right here, and then this piece over here are all one piece. You can see this tear right here. Let me see if I have a better picture of it on the next slide. Yeah, here's a better picture. Um, so in essence, what they've done is they've taken the corner of a piece of fabric, they've folded it in a cute little way, done a few snips, and that, that insets into um, this shoulder piece exactly, like right here. And then there's this piece right here is actually a dart that is sewn. Um, and so that creates the side shaping around the side of the bust, giving it a really smooth, tight look so that there's no um, bunching under the arms. Um, and as you can kind of see, like this is really not the standard armhole. Um, and so if you actually look at a lot of the manuscripts and the illustrations, um, there, there is some really sort of funky stuff going on sometimes with those front armholes um and so it, it's just interesting to see to finally see how it was really done i've done a lot of work on trying to reconstruct this gown these types of gowns before i saw the langberg finds and um once i saw once i saw these leather pieces um not leather pieces these linen pieces i was like wow like i really did not know what i was getting myself into or doing or anything like that um but again you've got um their their using a running a running stitch to um, um, baste or tack the wool to the linen lining and they do it in such a way that you can barely see it from the outside so you're just putting that needle you're putting that needle through the linen and just picking up just 
a little bit of the wool, um, and which is that is really thick um, uh, melting wool. So it's kind of tricky to, to just get like the perfect amount and then bringing it up back up to the linen and then pulling that stitch through and then moving on. So it's, it's not a, you can't do a whole line all at once. It's one stitch at a time. Um, and the, um, so the pleats on this one, because you're starting with the corner of a piece of fabric, they kind of collapse into the middle. Um, so you've got uh, more of a, more of a cup underneath each breast. Um, let me move on. Um, oh, the dart. Is that only the linen lining or is evidence of the wool is the same dart taken out? Okay, it's only the linen lining because I don't have any pictures of it. But basically, let's see. Here we go. Um, so this piece of wool right here is, and there's a couple pieces over here and over here. They're actually stitched over the top of the seam in the linen. There's no evidence of a woolen, of a seam in the wool over the top of that linen seam. So um, my, uh, the mock-ups, the test, the test, the test runs that I've done, um, I've done this the same way. And you actually um, form, the, the wool is very formable using steam and heat um, and all the stitching. So you, um, you, you, you form the wool to fit the linen um, and then the stitching holds it in place. Um, and yes, the wool is, um, I don't know if it's heavily, the original, I wouldn't say it's heavily fulled, but it is very fluffy. So there was quite a, a good nap on the original wool. Some of that has been eaten away by the moths and the, the rat and the mice, um, but, uh, yeah, it was it was definitely a very it was a not a, a thin wool at all. It was very very thick um, and substantial. Um, let's see. Has there any dye? There has been dye analysis, and I'll let um, I'll let Beatrix talk about that. Um, we actually, they actually did a paper on that called the Colors of Langbrook Castle, but um, Beatrix can talk about that if you want to talk about it right now. Uh, you want to know something about the dyes? Um, has yes, there any was dye a... analysis been done on the wool? Yes, yes, there was. There's also a paper on it. Uh, you can find it uh, on Academia. And uh, it's basically um, for the red wool, madder, and redwood. And for the blue, of course, um, indigo or woad. We can't distinguish that if it was a real indigo or woad. Um, okay. And then I think the last piece that I really wanted to talk about is, um, uh, it's really hard to see in the pictures, but there's actually, um, hopefully I can see it right down here, my pointer, maybe not. Um, on this, here's the seam which joins the, um, uh, the cup piece, we want to call it, to the shoulder piece. And there's actually a piece of linen um, tape that has been, um, uh, that each piece has been sewn to. Um, and basically, you first you hem the piece and then you whip stitch it into that piece of tape. So that provides the structure. Because otherwise, after you've been, um, Otherwise, everything would shift and move, and it wouldn't be able to handle the the um, strain of the the heavy weight of the wool. Um, okay, and then the third gown, which we haven't really talked very much about, is there's a little um, this little another girl's gown. It was originally made of red silk. There's just um, little uh, snippets left from um, here you can see, um, basically, there it was fully red silk at one time, and then they. Um, what, what I think happened was that the the either the edging wore off, they um, they it got worn, or they pulled ornamentation off of it that had been on there, and they needed to um, cover it up, so they bound it with a strip of linen. Um, 
but uh, it was originally stitched with blue linen thread. So you, so you get this red silk with blue linen thread um, uh, for ornamentation, um, and, which I find fascinating that they would do that. Um, and it's very simple. It does not have the pleats um, that the others do. It's a, it's a different piece. Um, it might be an undergown for a girl. We're not sure. It's about the same size as the blue um, wool gown, um, but it's not the same style. And um, I have not found a um, good example in manuscripts of the salad gown yet. All right, let's see, any other questions? Um, um, and yes, this does have a bit of a selvage um, on this gown right here on this one. Um, and you can see kind of how they've, they've handled it. All right, I'm gonna hit stop share. Um, oh wait, do I have one more? Oh, so this is a this is another picture of the women's gown um, showing the the inside the outside wool side and then the inside linen side um, of the top of the cup area. Um, and. Yeah, I think that's all I have for the gowns for right now. I can show, I can show some reconstructions if people want to see them. Um, let me just check whether moderate, um, anyway. Do you, do you ladies have anything you wanna say real quick? <laughs> uh, my reconstruction is loosely based on Marion's uh, patterning. And so I made some choices about my ankle and the back piece that are different from the So, um, but everything else I tried to faithfully uh, <laughs> All right. Um, were any dyed linen fabrics found or only dyed linen threads? That I know of just the thread uh, on the, it looked like someone had re-sewn the scrap of uh, the skirted bra back on with a blue dyed thread. Um, yeah, I, I know that the I know the dresses have that have a brown dyed thread, mm -hmm. and the girls' gown has a blue dyed thread. Mm -hmm. I know there's lots and lots of different woolen colors, but I don't know of any. What, are there any dyed linen fabrics, Beatrix? No, no, no. Just the the, the threads. I just can't. I can't remember. It may be just a tiny bit somewhere, but uh, not 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 nothing to to really talk about. Yeah, I mean, there's 2,700 textile fragments, and some of them are very small. So it's, there's a lot of stuff there. We do have a lot of different wool colors, not only blue and red, but also different shades of green, purple, or black. Um, yeah. We do not, we don't, don't have any yellow. There's no yellow uh, no. in the wool. There's no yellow wool. We do have yellow in silk, but yeah. no yellow in the wool. Yeah, some of those greens that, that were found in the finds are just fabulously gorgeous greens. Um, yeah. All right. So did you Let want to? Yeah. The, this is. If someone asks if there are not there aren't any men's clothes, this is a fabric of a men's hose, red wool with uh, blue wool lining. So this is, and you can see the the holes in it. Yeah. Well, um, the moths had themselves a party. Yeah. <laughs> and the rest of those, and, and there's how many other like hundreds of fragments of those same exact fabrics. So there probably was. Yeah, like that. We have, we have hose confetti yeah. because that hose is in so many pieces. Right. Yeah, and this is probably also another hose in, in, in black. It's probably a part of the cot piece from, uh, from another hose. <laughs> so yeah. yes, the, we do have, we do have some, some men's clothes, but not much. 
Um, since they were mostly wool, I guess, all got eaten up by the moths. <laughs> right. Um, were there any orange wolves? Mm, no. There's kind of some orangey red ones, but no orange. No. We have red. There's not different shades of red. Orange. No, I can't remember any orange ones. No. Um, somebody wanted to know how how we know that that piece you just held up is part of a of a hose. <laughs> um, <clears throat> educated guess. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's no, I mean, if you if you look at, at at hose patterns, cut patterns, and you can you can see that um, sometimes the cut piece is made of out of two of those. Right. So that that looks like a like half of a cut piece. Yeah. 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 We we could do a whole uh, <laughs> we could do a whole show on uh, on things that Rachel and I have learned or about how the archaeological process works. Through working with Beatrix, <laughs> and and from this from this uh, red hose here, there's also a fabric of the back seam with a seam allowance. Yes, there. that's right. A long a long piece about th this long, with a back seam. So that was definitely a hose, and yeah. you can even see there's still an eyelet here. Yep. There's a little eyelet here to to tie the hose. Yeah, and what I think is fascinating on that piece is that the center panel, which would run right down the middle of the front opening is on the straight. And then it, it's kind of inset into the bias piece. So yeah. you wouldn't get that gaping that can sometimes happen if the whole hose is co cut on the bias. Um, yeah. You get that, that yeah, little... Can, yeah. See here, this is, this is on the straight. This is right. on the straight here, and this is on the bias. Yeah, and there's a seam in between there. And it's yeah. all, it's stitched with backstitch and the blue and red are worked as one layer. Um, and then that. you have uh, on the inside you have uh, a, a linen tape strip. tape yeah probably for yeah in a reinforcement or something yeah uh, structural integrity <laughs> um, yeah so um, hmm. okay and was it common to have hose lined um, I there's, I don't know, was it common to have hose lined? I mean, kind of a warmth thing. It, where it's, the Langberg's in the mountains, so it's not, uh, it's not, it's not warm there. <laughs> um, maybe the, maybe just the upper parts. I've talked to um, Janet, Jane, and she she thought that maybe the hose were just lined to uh, just to the, to the, to the above the knee, so just mm. the upper part, and then then the lower part would not be lined. That would make maybe. sense. Because we have hose finds from the um, late 15th to 16th century from Corinthia, from from mines, where there's basically the whole the whole um, leg there, and there's also lining there, but the lining only goes to about knee height yeah that would make sense from a from a wear perspective and on then also like from a warmth perspective like it would be um uh it's it's interesting like how much warmth you lose out through your ankles <laughs> so like from a, like a temperature regulation um uh perspective having half lined hose would help you be able to reg better regulate your temperature, not get up, not get overheated. Okay. Um, someone wants to know what the, if there's a thread count on the fabric of the hose. Um, um, not really. That's, they, it's hard to count because the, the wool, the wool has been fooled. And um, you can see it. So you've had got the, the map here and it's really hard to, to count, to count threads because they're all sort of, um, stick together. So you can see here where the nap has worn off. Um, let me guess. Um, I don't know a bit more than than, than the, with, the, with the linen. Um, but it's really hard to count these things because they they have been fold. It's broadcloth, so that's been been woven and then fold. 
and uh, it all sticks together. It makes it makes the thread count uh, really hard to see the the single threads. But it is a thinner wool than the than the wool that the gowns are made out of. Um, I do remember that. Uh, yeah. That it does look a bit thinner, yes. Yeah. It's about the same color, but a little bit thinner. But of course, you've got two layers here, so that makes up for that. Yeah. And you can see the, the. Is the eyelet of the hose um, through that linen tape, or is it in the wool alone? No, it's just in the wool. I don't know. Can you see it? Yeah. Yep. Yes. Okay. Um, all right. So whenever we talk about the gowns, always the question comes up of like, will there be a pattern? And the answer is yes. <laughs> um, but it's not um, going to be the kind of pattern that you can just um, scale up uh, because these were custom drafted patterns. So what I've learned in working with um, the girl's gown and in creating the women's gown is that um, they were using, of course, you know, they're using body measurements as one would do to create a custom pattern, um, but they were not using the, um, a standard um, shape body block. I don't know how to, I'm trying, let me think about this for a minute. Um, uh, let me just grab something off my um, board here. Um, I wanted to show you from, <laughs> let me grab this over here. So this is, okay, no, it's not a ball. This is my reconstruction of the girl's gown. And hopefully we can see this on the screen. So this right here is the um, back armhole and this is the size of the cut that is made to get that back armhole. So this is not just a um, uh, <laughs> a simple pattern. There's a lot of geometry involved and a lot of measurements and they um, they use measurements like from the middle of the neck to the shoulder. And then you take half of that measurement and you take that and you do it at a, at a specific angle. And then you do this and you do that. So it's, it's kind of um, an interesting math problem um, uh, involving circles and angles and, <laughs> and arcs. Um, uh, then, um, then I would say modern pattern drafting is, or even, um, you know, even moving forward into like post 1500 when the Italian styles come in that are much more simple and do not involve elaborate, um, pleats. Uh, so there will be a pattern and it's be more of a, of a method for drafting your own. Although I do hope um, to be able to do it uh, digitally so I can create custom um, patterns based on people's measurements. So, um, oh, and someone wanted to know if the wool fabric was twill or tabby woven on the hose. Um, tabby. tabby. Tabby, yes. Okay. It wouldn't make any sense to have a twill if you've got to full it anyway, because after fulling, you won't see the twill. It's, it's right. tabby, yes. Yeah. Most okay. of them is tabby. I think we have two or three fra fragments of twill wool, but most of the wool is, is tabby. Also on the gowns. Yes. Um, let me think about this. And I'm just checking. Uh, okay, let me just check. I think we are pretty good with the plans of what we were intending to um, present. So, um, if there are any questions, um, that need to be answered, moderator, please, please let us know. 
Okay, are there more publications describing the findings and how they are reconstructed than in the description box? Um, there are none written right now, but I know that Beatrix and Rachel have one coming out about the headwear, which we didn't, you know, assume. You guys want to talk about that? Yeah, that's well, there is there is a publication on the sorry there is a publication on the uh, underpants but that's written in german so <laughs> yeah the headwear is actually there is an article on academia uh called the Enig enigmatic beauty the headwear of langberg castle um but it will also be in a book coming up soon it's uh beatrix can you i can't remember the name of it but it's coming out as an article as part of a book yeah it's uh, coming out as an article and part of a, a um, conference papers for the collingwood conference that had took place in london yeah. um i hope this year because i don't i didn't don't have the the um correction stuff yet but uh, well hopefully maybe this year <laughs> uh it's going to be an oxbow book um i also saw a question um that i don't think i answered about how i handled the insertion of the spring in the bra and uh that was uh pretty complicated <laughs> i did have to um unravel some of the um, the spring. So the spring, you know, when you make spring, it's in a rectangle, right? And uh, so to insert it, originally when I was making my own bras for myself, I was just sort of gathering in the spring like this, but it makes it sort of bulky in this space. So I made the choice of unraveling the outer edges to create this sort of triangular shape. So um, it's unraveled and then very carefully um, knotted and then whip stitched into the edge of the, um, the needle lace uh, on the inner cups. So that was that piece. I don't know, was there anybody else? Any evidence of the reversal on the spring or is it more just a fancy form of interlinking slash plating that has not worked as fixed warp Spring. So we don't have the other half of the spring. So there, there has been questions from some people about can, can you prove it spring? Well, the fact that I was able to recreate the thing using spring as a, you know, as my method on a fixed, war, uh, a fixed loom um, tells me that it's possible that it can be made using spring as your technique. I don't know about other techniques. They look different. I've heard of that. Um, Beatrix, there's a there's a a form that's sort of like plating, but it's loose. Uh, and I saw a, a video on how that's done, and it it doesn't look the same when you look at um, that technique. So. Yeah, there's a there's a um, Scandinavian technique called fear reflecting. Um, that but that actually looks more like like you would do uh, bobbin lace because you always you use four threads um, to twist together instead of just two. Um, as to sprang, there are some uh, 15th century images that seem to show women working on a sprang frame, and there is another uh, 15th century sprang that's definitely sprang uh, in the Swiss uh, museum big tablecloth that's made from the sprang and that does have a middle line so the technique of sprang was definitely known in the 15th century um, i'm looking at a couple of the other questions and i think we answered those um there are a couple gown questions um yeah. so uh how how does the gown fasten on the front um so there, um, uh, Rachel is using um, decorative hooks and eyes um, or on the outside, which are seen often um, in um, manuscripts and so forth. 
um, the Lang on these um, on these the Langberg finds, um, we've got um, hooks and eyes um, left on a couple of different um, of the linings. Um, that's at the neckline on the inside. And then at the waist, it's, it's a tie. Um, and yeah, it's a tie, which um, on the, um, which on the finds is just a simple like piece of thread, um, which, uh, um, which I've done on the reconstruction and that does not work well. <laughs> so yeah, I think I'm gonna need to replace it with like a braided thread or a finger loop thread because just doing a simple thread for a tie um, tends to untwist and unravel and just becomes unusable after, after just a few wearings. Um, and is the dress made from eight pieces? Uh, let me think two in the front i don't know are we are we including pieces <laughs> i mean piecing of the skirt let's see two two parts of the sleeve so that's four and then two fronts and then uh it could be one or two in the back depending on how it was constructed so if you include the two pc two piece sleeves it could be eight pieces so mine is uh the body pieces of mine are are fewer, so I'm not including the sleeves, and that's I'm thinking that's what they mean. Um, and I did not include any doors, I because I was using the patterning that Marion was suggesting, um, because I'm just using five. Well, she's asking if there's an eight piece. It, so, so, the reason why Catherine's asking this is because there's a manuscript, Taylor's manuscript, that talks about the eight piece dress. So, and from the 15th century. So anyway, um, does the tie align with the pleat reinforcement stitch stitching? And yes, it does. Otherwise, um, it doesn't close. <laughs> the pleats, the pleats want to be a be apart in their own distinct groupings. Um, they do not want to be together. In fact, if I if I rotate this and I pull I have this pinned to the mannequin, otherwise it will not, um, they really want to be like this. Yeah, they do. Yep. Separate, their own distinct pieces. In order to get them to come together, you have to tie them. Um, or in my case, since I don't have a tie, I use T-pens and I stab them. <laughs> Which you can't really do on, on a person. <laughs> so when I when I wear my gown, I've got these um, just scooter easy net things of the create um X and I. Uh, when I wear that, the only other thing that's holding the, the gown closed are, is the tie right here. And then I wear a belt. And the belt holds everything closed. I don't get any gaping right here in this space at all. Just the fullness of the pleats everything together. Sorry, I'm blocking my face. I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> so someone um, asked about, uh, do have I found any paintings, illustrations, etc., that show bra chemises with the spraying insert? No, I have not. But most of them are like they're dipping here. There's, there's, I haven't found any images of this deep cut that the Langberg uh, piece has. Um, and I think it would gap open. I don't think I've ever tried it on without it. Um, it I think it would just flop open if, if I didn't have something there. So right. we did have to sort of, there was some guesswork there. It is true. Yeah. Um, somebody wants to know about the German underpants piece. Like some of your, our watchers are German and are interested in that article. I just saw that in the question. Um, yes, it's, it's also on, on my academia account. Um, let me, what is it called? Um, Gebrauchsgegenstand und Symbol. Die Bruch von Lenkberg. You can find it, it's online on, on academia. Just if you go to my academia page and scroll down, you'll post bound to find it. 
Um, you've got the, the 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 photos there of the inner pans and the pattern that I drew. It's not a it's it's, the, it's as it is. So with the uh, repair patches on and so. So it's not really a pattern in in sense of for a tailor. And there's also the there's the second fragment of a the fragment of a second pair of underpants in there because there was a second pair. It's just a fragment though. Um, someone asks, it's like, uh, yes, the dress is like a front opening robe that you just belt on. Is the circumference of the waist fitted to the wear or is it just belted in as an over wide body? So it's, it's fitted. Um, the, it's actually, it's actually, that's, that's part of how you create the pleats is you, um, the way I do it is I take the unfinished, the, take the gown with the side seam sewn and I, pin it to the side of the mannequin or the person. Um, <clears throat> and then I, um, and then I'll pleat the fronts and pleat the backs with it vertical. You cannot, um, you can't pleat, pleat it properly um, laying down flat. It really needs the hang of gravity to be able to, to, I don't know, change the grain of the fabric so that it drapes nicely. Um, there's a lot of, um grain manipulation of the of the fabric um to be able to make these dresses work and you can't get that with them lying on a flat surface which is why if you look at 15th century german tailor images like in the um nuremberg um brothers manuscript um all the tailors have the gowns and they're hanging on hangers and they're that they're vertical and they're setting the pleats um and so i think we've got a five minute how, um, yes, so I gather the pleats as I drape it on um, on the stand. So I already have the pleats built into the pattern. The pattern's already set. And then as, um, sorry, I'm, so I draft, <laughs> let me think about this. I have a pattern and I draft it and I cut it out. And that, but I create, the, I form the actual pleats of the gown while it's vertical on a person or on a mannequin. Um, Rachel is just about the same size as this mannequin. So I could um, use it to form the pleats um, into the right shape and form. Um, and yeah, otherwise I wouldn't be able to do it because you can't, you can't do it laying down flat. It does not work. No, and when I, when I made mine, I, um, I did put it on myself and I held it in place and pinned where I needed it to pin. I had to do it by myself. I didn't have anybody helping me, but we live across the country from each other and that's very inconvenient. <laughs> it is. It is incredibly inconvenient. Yeah. Um, so we are going to wrap this up real soon. Are there, If there are any more questions, I need to go in the live chat right now. Um, otherwise, we will you can put them in the comments and we will uh, cover them on the next one. <laughs> we will be doing more of these and breaking down each of the pieces into each of the pieces into their own episode. So we're really excited to do this. Yes. Any, yes. Last, any last questions? <laughs> I <have to> go. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <clears throat> uh, I did remember the name of the the stitch that I used to uh, attach to the used for the needle lace to attach it to the spring. It is the Brussels stitch. It's that simple. All right. So um, we don't have a date set for the next one, but um, we will be working on that and um, getting that. Uh, set up and <clears throat> planned and uh, out uh, <laughs> relatively soon. Um, and like Rachel said, we have plans for a great deal more. So um, I guess that's it, ladies. Thank you so much for coming. And thanks everybody for, for watching and asking such great questions. That was were really awesome. So anything else? In. Yeah, I'm. I'm good. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, Beatrix, thank you so much for um, 
for coming today and bringing the finds and your expertise and um, yeah. All right. Well, we will see you all later. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Finishing the live stream. Just do this. Sorry. I'm just trying to find the right 